reading a little bit because I'm not as cool and spontaneous as some of the other people who've been here. And I've also got the presentation as well. So I look a bit, just to age myself, a bit Jean-Michel Jarre with the kind of thing, but no light effects, sadly. So thank you for coming. <clears throat> I'm going to start with a bit of history. Does anyone recognize the place in this picture? So a few people. So, if you ever visit London and you travel to the very busy, bustling area of London Bridge and then turn down a quiet street nearby, you'll come across a wild garden hidden behind high fences and walls. This is that garden. In the 1990s, the land was discovered to be the final resting place of thousands of people who'd been deemed unworthy of Christian burial in the Middle Ages. Among them were quite a number of women who had worked in local brothels. Brothels that had, and I think this is a fascinating piece of church history, been licensed by the church who also collected the profits. Oh, I know, I know. The women, along with their illegitimate children, were hidden away from respectable society even after they died. And as far as we know, the Bishop of Winchester, who was the one who profited at the time, is no longer involved in such activities, but I will have a little um, anonymous tip line if anyone wants to let me know afterwards. But now, after hundreds of years, the church is trying to make amends for who it judged worthy or not, or at least some parts of the church are. And now, and this is something that people can go along to, once a month, a procession makes its way from Southwark Cathedral nearby to the garden, which is now called Crossbones, in an act of remembrance. And the reason this is a little bit relevant to what I'm talking about today is for a long time the place was known as the single woman's churchyard. Can you guess why? Well, simply that the term single woman was interchangeable with sex worker. The centuries often haven't been kind to single people, women in particular. And outside of the framework of coupled life, where a woman was legally subsumed into a man's identity, I mean, who knew what havoc and disruption they were capable of? They actually had a word for it, coverture, an 18th century legal commentary, which will partly appear. Has it gone yellow? OK. So an 18th century legal commentary described it as, by marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. You can guess who wins. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection, and cover she performs everything. She basically ceased to exist once she got married. And the married woman was known in legal terms as the femme covert, which sounds almost like a spy, but actually just means the covered woman. So... That was it. She was covered by her husband. Everything she owned belonged to him. She had no rights to generate any income for herself, to sign legal contracts, buy property. Anything that made her separate to him was out. And if you wanted to be exempt from this at the time, it was simple. Just don't get married. You just need to have your family to agree to it, have other ways to support yourself, and of course, back then, most women didn't. Or, little loophole, you could be queen. Queens had more options. They could not be covered, legally speaking. And it seems like ancient history, but actually it's not. For women marrying even a few decades ago, well within many of our lifetimes, options were still very limited. Women were steered towards marriage by social expectation and by the law. I'm going to do a quick quiz. OK, so we know that the first women got the vote about 100 years ago, 101 although it obviously wasn't granted willingly, and only some women, and only if they were over 30, and only if they met certain property requirements. But what year did it become possible for British women to open a bank account in their own name? Ni 1975. Thank you, person who looked at my talk maybe earlier. Very good, very good which is also the same year that an American woman could apply for a credit card in her own name. So until then, you couldn't, simply couldn't do it. Women had to wait until 1978 before they could be uh, pregnant without being fired from their jobs. And maternity pay wasn't a legal requirement in the UK until, anyone know? 1986. So plenty of people in here will have had mothers who 
decided to have them without knowing whether or not they would get any support from work at all. So it was, it was quite risky. And rape within marriage wasn't recognised until 1991. So the idea that women could be single, have choices, flourish, came with significant roadblocks. Marriage was the ideal, and anything that allowed women to choose alternatives was often prevented by law, if not by convention. And the church loved it. The church was wedded to it. That's a little marriage joke. Okay. Christian equaled respectable. But the version of marriage that became known as Christian hadn't been carried faithfully from ancient times, not at all. It is something of a hybrid, an odd combination of, I'm going to give you the little list, Old Testament patriarchy, which was men mostly in charge, but you know, without the polygamy, pretty much. Uh, New Testament orderliness, but without the championing of singleness. It was much more one woman, one man, get on with it. Very strict. Tudor times, uh, now introducing the beloved tradition of loving and honouring and not parting until death, if we just overlook the fact that divorce was central to the creation of the Church of England. (laughs) Yep. Victorian purity. Um, We know women had no legal rights. And even though these marriages were praised for being decades long... Where else could they go? You know, they had to stay once they were married, and those who didn't fit into the mould could end up as fallen women, and often really bad things happened to them. And then there's a little bit of the 1950s too, the only time really in um, modern Western history where women have been happily at home, apparently happily at home, and men were the breadwinners. So that's kind of the bits that most people think Christian marriage consists of, and it's not one thing. It's certainly not this sort of biblical marriage that people have pulled wholesale from thousands of years ago into the present. And it's an institution that finds itself still in the grip of a post-sexual revolution panic and a call for some Christians to return to the good old days, which are this hybrid of all the useful bits plucked from history rather than one thing that ever existed in its own right. For a lot of Christians, marriage equaled one woman and one man, abstinent and then wildly passionate in a lifelong faithful union. I might have expected a bit of a laugh then, because you just, you know, (laughs) who knows, who knows? Uh, Of course, fertility was guaranteed, as, as was contentment. And you kind of think, well, doesn't that sound a bit out of date? Are marriage and the traditional family still so beloved of Christians in the present day? Well... In a moment of madness, one that ended up taking three years and became a book, I decided to find out. Silly me. Right. I started to research not only the history and present state of singleness, love and relationships, hence the little history lesson that we sat through, but also what the future could look like, especially where faith was a factor. I created a survey that nearly 1,500 people responded to, and I asked about everything. I didn't really hold back, and neither did they. I thought, oh, I'll just ask a few questions and see what happens. And I think 200 people replied in the first weekend and pulled out their hearts. So this was obviously something that really mattered to people. And many people that I surveyed were taught this historical hybrid version of marriage in one form or another. Some were quite young, just out of their teens. Others were in their 50s and 60s. But they'd all had a similar kind of teaching of this odd Christian marriage that actually was made up of all these different bits. Um, They were taught it regardless of sexual orientation or of any other preferences. Single life was rarely mentioned, much less as a positive alternative. And the patterns and shapes of life may have changed in the present, but perceptions and prejudices are, as you know, a lot harder to shift. Can anyone think of any positive words exist even now for the state of single womanhood? I've got a bit of a list got spinster, which did start off as a positive because it meant an independent woman making her living through spinning. Got old maid, got thorn back. You have to reach a certain age, a grand old age of, I think it was of 25, and then you became a thorn back. And then Christmas cake, which meant you were good if, if you were consumed by a certain date. None of them are nice words. Men may have had it better, being eligible bachelors and men about town, but overall, society has remained suspicious or pitying of single people. Just after the First World War, there was a generation of women who'd been brought up to be good wives, so they couldn't go to university, they couldn't own their own livings. Their aim, their purpose in life, they were brought up just to get married, 
And they found themselves forced into singleness when the First World War took the men that they would have married and also the Spanish flu epidemic. And there were estimated to be two million women in the UK at this time. And they got the label surplus women, which is quite grim. But apparently, Agatha Christie's Miss Marple was one of these surplus women. They were women that were sort of forced into independence and single life simply because there were just no options. And actually, there are some women who replied to me who said, well, church life is quite similar to that. You know, <laughs> you're told that you'll, get, you'll grow up to get married, and actually, when you don't, you have to figure it out differently. And these women had no choice but to make lives outside of social expectations, but they were pitied for it. They weren't respected. And no matter how much social upheaval occurred, even another world war, Christianity still championed traditional marriage. So after World War II where there'd been a 70% rise in sexually transmitted infections as people threw caution to the wind and other garments that they might have had on. <laughs> and there were thousands of additional births outside of marriage as well. People were urged by the then Archbishop of Canterbury to return to Christian living. And as a consequence, marriage increased. People didn't carry on their uh, way of life that they'd had when the constraints were off. They, they were obedient. They got married again. And by the early 50s, a national survey found that two-thirds of British people surveyed thought women shouldn't have any sexual experience out of marriage, though only half thought the same for men. So the maths never quite works, does it? There's always that bit of inequality. And of course, heterosexuality was the only legal option for men and the only socially acceptable one for women. Two world wars, not to mention all the wars before them, hadn't changed much, the traditional church, traditional family was still the preferred church option, fully endorsed. Change was slow. In 1957, a survey of American attitudes towards singleness found that 80% of people believed that someone who chose to be single was happy, independent, strong, no, sick, neurotic, and immoral. <laughs> nice. And too often, the church hasn't known what to do with single people either. Despite social changes and, of course, a holy book that redefines the purpose of singleness as far back as the first century, the entwining has been strong. But now, more people are living alone than ever before, including nearly 4 million people in England and Wales, part of over 200 million globally. It's really quite a big shift. In America, single people are almost half of the adult population. And the length of marriage has fluctuated too. The average length of a marriage in England and Wales in 2014 was 11.7 years. And I found this uh, little historical fact quite interesting. You can tell I like historical facts by now, I think. But only short, slightly shorter than this was marriage in colonial-era America, where they were estimated to have lasted 12 years. However, they may have ended more because of diphtheria, malaria, and smallpox than in the present-day home counties, we think. Marriage is happening later too, meaning people spend more of their adult lives single and need new skills to navigate that, but we're being quite slow to catch up. Rather than marrying young in order to set up an adult life and home, it's much more common for people to establish individual independent identities before considering tying themselves to another person. The average age of marriage has been increasing over the last few decades. The marriage historian in America called Stephanie Koontz has calculated that we're now on average single for 50% of what's been known as the prime of life years between 18 and 55. And I know we all have prime of life years outside those years. That's what she said. That's what I said. Whatever age you are, you're in your prime. To me, you all look great. <laughs> so just putting that out there. And it used to be that it was 20% of the prime of life years back in the 60s. So we're now having to navigate this new stage of adulthood, single, where it used to just be you got married young and you stayed married until you died. Marriage is still beloved of government authorities and, of course, the church, but not all Christians, certainly not all the ones I spoke to. And my findings were interesting. I thought they were interesting. Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> As throughout history, the experiences of men and women varied, but some things were common. So here's what some people told me, and all but a handful of these people, these 1,500, described themselves as Christian in some shape, and the shapes were many and varied. So did people expect to be treated differently if they were single? Overall, resoundingly, yes. 
over two-thirds thought that couples are more respected than single people in church or Christian culture. Almost as many believe pressure to get married is strong in their faith community. Only just over half said they felt valued and welcomed in Christian life regardless of their relationship status. And just under half felt that Christian life prioritizes nuclear families. And yet, outside of the church, marriage is starting to look quite different. In 2017, in Scotland, humanist weddings outnumbered Church of Scotland ceremonies for the first time. We now have heterosexual couples who want civil partnerships rather than marriages, trying their case in court. Couples are choosing to personalize their commitments, not with church ceremonies, but with informal ceremonies conducted by friends and family. And then certain groups are overrepresented in the church too. There are more women than men, estimated to be around twice as many women to men, a ratio some of you may be more familiar with than others. This alone has a huge impact on the quality of relationships and the ability to have good friendships, regardless of whether someone wants to get married or not. If you're told by your faith community you should marry inside it, but there are twice as many women as men, but they're not planning on bringing back polygamy. Okay, there's a maths problem again. Research by Single Friendly Church shows that more married people choose to go to church than single people, so again, overrepresented, but a third of adults in British churches are single. And unlike society in general, the majority of adults in churches are married. So it's sort of like real life, kind of, but different. And the ethics vary too and cause some debate. Traditionally, and even in the present day, some Christians have been taught to wait until marriage to have sex. Society was fully on board with this too, at least as much as anyone admitted to. It just wasn't the done thing. It wasn't respectable to embrace any other way of life. And for those who still hold to this, is it possible to have a full single life? Two-thirds of my respondents said that church culture expects single people to be abstinent. Around the same number said they felt that society encourages people to lust after each other, and that didn't make things easier either. There may be, in a lot of churches, a don't ask, don't tell approach where personal choices aren't openly discussed. Or things may be more hard line and you have to comply or be farewelled, find yourself somewhere else to uh, have a spiritual community. And it can be assumed that anyone who isn't married is somehow effortlessly chased and patiently waiting for the day they are chosen to be someone's spouse, because often that's the, the dynamic, that the man is active and the woman is passive. And I'd love to tell you this is all old-fashioned, but it's still what people are hearing, it's still what they're being taught. The assumption may be spot on for some people, but also wildly off base for others. They may be expected to be content to be single forever, on hand as a babysitter and church rotor filler. I can remember a few years ago, a, a pastor I had who had eight children saying, just think of all the time you've got to pray. I thought, yeah, sure, I know what you're doing when I'm praying, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People may be previously married or parenting solo, they're managing uh, to deal with life alone as well. And they've been taught overall views on the importance of marriage this is how some people told me they'd heard marriage described to them, as a promotion going to the next level, reaching maturity, something that sets people apart and qualifies them for great responsibility. Now they are a couple, which I thought was, is it Superman or Spider-Man that's meant to have great responsibility? Anyway, married people too, apparently. The only way to be fulfilled. It's been likened to gaining holiness, learning vital lessons, growing in no ways no other relationship or shape of life could offer. You can see why people feel the pressure. And the way this manifests can depend also on how the sexes are viewed. I ask people, do you think God ordained particular roles for men and women in life and relationships? 40% of people said yes. Aren't they sweet, their little feet? What do they mean by roles? Well, usually a God-chosen order that required male leadership in some form and female submission. Maybe not a harsh dictatorship, but a relationship where decision-making ultimately rested with the husband, who would both protect and provide, although these terms were really, rarely explored. And more than one person said to me, well, it means the book stops with the man. So, 
And also one American respondent told me it was really also to do with how well you could handle a firearm as to whether you were a true protector. So I did get quite an array of views, yeah. This was regarded as a natural order, and it meant both would flourish if they lived out their place in the hierarchy, ideally minus guns, ideally. And what was particularly hard about this teaching was the suggestion that marriage especially this kind of marriage, was something that would make the participants closer to God and reflect something about the order of the Trinity. It was all very mystical and mysterious. And when the marriage is perceived as this promised land and this place of divine structure and hierarchy, it, it's almost going against God in that culture to say you want to do something different, that maybe you want to be more egalitarian or you want to split the decisions differently. But it does go some way to explaining why it's still popular. Aside from it being the only legitimate way that people were told they were allowed to have sex in quite a lot of situations. And then I wondered what happens to people who are single in this, in this environment for whatever reason. And many people had been told that God would give them a spouse at the designated time. And until then, they should be on guard. Wary of being led astray. I, I added that. Nobody, actually, nobody was actually taught those actions. But if I might start a chastity defense class at the end if anyone wants to join. Let's see, we'll give you a warm-up. Um, we'll pretend it's yoga or something. I don't know. And until then, until that fateful moment, they should be on guard, wary of being led astray, either into forbidden sexiness, or an imbalanced relationship where neither person leads the way, also known as kind of mutual submission or partnership. This was apparently a bad thing. Or even worse, the woman makes the decisions. <laughs> Whatever next. What's notable is where significant sections of the church had started to move away from this belief, it's begun to re-emerge in the mainstream, again, dressed in Christian language. Yeah. You might have noticed the rise of right-wing populist leaders around the world who align with Christians in order to get elected in the first place and in the promotion of the traditional family. And they're stripping back rights that we will probably see as progressive in accordance with this. The inclusion of so-called Christian values is starting to appear in political manifestos and speeches. There are angry online communities of men's rights activists, some who claim to be Christian in an anti-feminist, anti-PC kind of way, who insist society is better when women know their place. Can you guess where it is? At home, in the kitchen, having babies. Yeah. There was quite a funny uh, tweet the other day. I say funny. I mean, okay. Self-declared patriarch, husband, and love coach. Quite the bio if anyone's looking to refresh their social media accounts. Yep, and there's a lot of them, you know, there's a lot building their presence online. He informed the world, and I quote, women need the boundaries of the patriarchy and a mission in life, which is usually husband, children, and home. Absent such a structure, they malfunction <laughs> and destroy civilizations. <laughs> yep. Yep, I've got a sign-up sheet for that after the session. You can tick a box for whichever civilization you want to destroy. We can, we can do the warm-up as well, also. Yep. But his views aren't particularly different to a lot of Christians. They want a return to traditional roles. Talk of God having given Christianity a masculine feel. Have you heard that one? Muscular Christianity creeping back into conversation the ongoing teaching that God created a natural order in which both men and women thrive. All these mutterings that women are simply happier as wives and mothers. And I even heard a few saying they didn't really want the vote. They were quite happy in the kitchen back then. They were forced. So, you know, these are Christians that are having these conversations. And there's legislation to assure, ensure that women have few choices, especially in countries that South America, for example, has a few examples of that. And though it may seem shocking to hear what was legalized in previous centuries, it somehow doesn't seem too much like wild conjecture that progress isn't automatic or guaranteed. Those who watch The Handmaid's Tale and news reports from around the world may observe worrying similarities. The echoes through history that men are cleverer, and I'm sure all you men in here are, 
I'm sure that's not in doubt. And the women offer a guiding morality that can somehow improve and save a man. I mean, this is still being taught. And as unlikely as it may sound, such ideas often came from the heart of the scientific community, home of logic and progress. Here's a little quote. I certainly think that women, though generally superior to men in moral qualities, are inferior intellectually, said Charles Darwin. Yeah. What a guy. <laughs> so, once again, Christian values in some places are becoming indistinguishable from an idea that, ideal that favors male dominance and female submission. So where do single people thrive in such an environment? And why would single people want to be married? And yet, marriage held a strong appeal for a lot of single Christians I spoke to. Over two-thirds I asked said marriage was still a goal for them. But the marriage they were envis envisioning was a romantic and positive proposition, one of teamwork, partnership, love, and equality. It was also a place where the abstinent got to have sex, so some people were very, very keen for this to take place, quickly as well. But one doesn't have to travel too far back to see how different marriage was, particularly for women. And outcomes for girls and women still vary across the world in terms of sex-selective abortion, medical care, contraception, education, and forced marriage for children. But the pervasive view of marriage has always been positive in this country. Can you imagine being that happy? Can you? <laughs> marriage gets happier over time, trumpeted the Daily Mail earlier this year. Of course they did. They, along with much of the media, offer regular tips on how to be happily married with certain conditions. Marriage makes you happier, but only if you earn less than $60,000, or own more than one TV, or if you have particular hormone levels, there's another one, or separate homes, or sleep apart, or, and this is the one that comes up the most, if you're a man. Yeah, if you're a man. The positive or negative effects of marriage can't be agreed. Some say it makes you happier, some say it doesn't. It seems that you'll be approximately as happy before as you were after. Marriage itself won't make you happier, it won't fix things. And a lot depends on how happiness is being measured. But there are, as a little aside, some stats on what makes a marriage more likely to last. These are actual findings, but not mine. So, if you want the best chance, Anyone who's already married, keep going. This is not to put you off. You're already there. You're doing well. Anyone who isn't, dating for at least three years, not marrying for looks or money, mm -hmm. having a honeymoon, having a big wedding, classed as over 200 people, apparently you're more than 12 and a half times as likely to divorce if you elope. But the key thing is not spending a lot of money on your big wedding. So your best chance of staying married, according to this research, is to spend less than a thousand pounds, which divided by the 200 guests, after you've removed the cost of outfits, flowers, ceremony, and so on. Yeah. Um, and they can't measure whether a couple is actually happy or not, they're just married. And actually, if your friends have stopped speaking to you because they went home from your wedding starving, you may as well <laughs> stay married. Why not? What else are you gonna do? And also, going to church is a key factor in staying married, which sort of relates to the fact that the church has more married people in it. And when we talk about marriage, we tend to visualize a particular thing, a commitment made for the rest of life. Although I'm not sure she's going to live that long if they don't catch her, so, you know. But an interesting survey by Time magazine in 2014 suggested some other formats that marriage could turn into. There was the presidential marriage. Vows for an initial four years, and then after eight years, you can elect to choose a new partner. And a fifth of respondents quite liked this idea. <laughs> there was the multiple partner marriage, which 10% of people liked. The till death do us part, very literal, no divorce at all marriage, which nearly a third wanted. And the beta marriage, an option that increased in popularity the younger the respondent. The beta is a committed partnership that can be dissolved without consequence after two years or renewed and formalized if both parties agree. How romantic is that? But that was the one that actually came out the top. So, which one would you go for? If you're with a current partner, you just, just think it, don't say it out loud, I don't want to cause any issues. Anyone that shouts, till death do us part, beta, and then looks at each other. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do if that happens. 
But amid all of this, single people come in many shapes now. I mean, literal shapes, but, you know, shapes of life. Rather than the stage before marriage encompasses anything that means not currently married, it's quite an inad inadequate word. Widowed, divorced, separated, never married, any age, all kinds of experiences. And yet it's very hard not to live under what's been called the shadow of marriage, the default state. The return to family values, which, as we've said, is popular with right-leaning politicians and Christians alike, is equated with marriage tax breaks depend on it. We've pushed down that road. Even if we now have the first prime minister to live in number 10 with one woman while married to another, and a US president married to his third wife. But both representing very right-leaning politics, and at least one claiming the Bible is his favorite book, though he can't quote any of the verses and he likes the Old and New Testament equally. I think he's never opened it personally, but don't tell him I said that in case I ever want to go to America. Single people were expected to have the gift. A calling from God to stay single, which meant that no one-on-one -on -one relationships could happen, no sex at all, and remember, no thoughts of sex either. You had to somehow empty your mind, body, everything of those thoughts, and have a life navigated solo. The fact that this would come with practical challenges, the risks of long-term illness, disability, financial security, home ownership, all of the things that people would have to navigate on their own, were really rarely mentioned. But we know that society is growing more fragmented. Loneliness is increasing. The connectivity of social media can be a lifeline and also an unhelpful reminder of how others are living, or at least how they claim to be. If the church keeps championing marriage as the best state, even if that's simply by modeling it through who appears to have status, value, and leadership opportunities, or who, I mean, the same church that I went to with the eight-kid pastor, he used to give couples one weekend a month off for quality time. Quality time. While well, we put the chairs out. Yeah. Yeah. Championed marriage in that church. Yeah. So, you can see, not that I carry any of this, but hurt and isolation <laughs> may lurk under the surface just saying it could happen. That's all. And many good opportunities are being missed to build genuine community. Single people are often forced to look further and work harder to find it. In my research, those who were looking not to be single faced a wider culture for dating that their married churchmates often knew nothing about. They described it as challenging, confusing, contradictory, hard and uncertain. What fun. People believed there was pressure on new relationships in church as marriage was expected to happen quickly. And they thought church leaders are often out of touch with what's happening romantically in their congregations, but my suspicion is quite a lot of church leaders will be relieved about that and just want to keep it that way. Just 2% of people who responded to me said they felt called to be single, but 40% were. They often felt pressured to put on a brave face. But the reality was quite different. Somehow, for the church to stop idolizing marriage above other ways of life, foundational things need to change. Instead of talking about being countercultural, it really needs to happen. Everyone needs to know that they are valued, no matter what. We're part of a society that encourages people to hoard, not only not to share, but not to want to share. Me and mine, to aspire and attain, not to humble ourselves and admit vulnerability. It's why, in part, the Christian message has been so revolutionary. The New Testament believers sold their possessions and pooled their money so that no one went without. They modeled community. They were told that they should only marry if they were about to explode with desire, but otherwise were advised to stay single. And there's an American theologian, Jennifer Wright Nust, who, and I paraphrase here, said, if we really took that seriously, there would probably be a lot more examples of people literally becoming eunuchs as there were in the, in the early days of the church. But I'm not, I'm not here, just so anyone knows, I'm not here to encourage a return to that at all. I'm just saying that's what she said. So please, nobody do that. Okay. So... Again, when I asked people if they'd consider living in mixed community, not with me, just more generally, um, it would have to be a big house, wouldn't it? Just over a third said yes, so it would have to be a very big house. And over two-thirds of single people said marriage was still a goal for them. 
often after giving many reasons why they weren't treated as well as married people, so no surprise there. At some level, many people value the idea of investing in others in the long term. Research suggests that people of all faiths volunteer more than those who have none. And indeed, in my research, over 70% were up for mentoring or supporting others. This is an interesting aside. Someone highly religious is no more likely to recycle than anyone else. I'm just going to put that out there. That was just an extra fact. So what are the alternatives for housing? Could we de-pedestal marriage by looking at alternatives to the one house, one family unit? It's tricky. Even as council houses are allocated, they go up on a size of family basis, so you may find larger houses actually left empty because there isn't a family size to fit, whereas you could have a combination who could actually make a home there. Have you heard of the Hoffiers? They're not people. They're actually purpose-built communities sent around courtyards where single people could live together but with independence. They're in the Netherlands. A well-known one of these was built in the 15th century for religious women who didn't want to go into convents, and it's still lived in by single women today. Or have you heard of Bestie Row? It's some land bought by a group of older people who built their own small matching properties to see out life together. While researching the book, I spoke to people who joined temporary monastic communities and those who committed to long, lifelong arrangements, others who created scattered community, committing to prioritise each other, though not living together. But most of society seems unwilling any time soon to accommodate or aspire to living arrangements that are anything other than standard. So people are taking action. Choosing communal living for the long term, like housing cooperatives, often driven by property prices too. But one woman I spoke to had moved into a commune in California with single people and couples with children, and said that even if she married in the future, she would now seek out a similar arrangement rather than live just as a couple. What she'd expected to be difficult, she's now described as an enriching gift. But is the church overall doing anything active to help with this? While loneliness grows, our old model's being reinforced over and over. You'll be fine as long as you find someone. What does a flourishing community in which everyone thrives actually look like? And if the church has more women than men, are expectations being projected onto them? Are they expected to be more available to help? Putting the chairs out, like I said. Yeah. And to be the backbone of the church while being seen as having no emotional needs. But it doesn't mean that they don't have responsibilities. They're going to be supporting themselves and maybe children or other relatives too. So who is meeting their needs practically and pastorally? Who's sharing the burdens of life with them? And there are practical things too that could be done simply. Eating together is significant. Eating alone by choice is great, but to have no options is something else altogether. What regular opportunities could be created for people to share the real daily moments of life together? The ones where it doesn't matter if you have a spouse or not. And how much is friendship valued? There's a joke that I stumbled across that the most unbelievable thing about Jesus is him being a man in his 30s and having 12 close friends. <laughs> yeah. Often it's a secondary consideration, something to be replaced by marriage. But marriage will not be the answer to all relational needs. You can be married and still lonely. The Bible emphasizes different priorities, but the church often does not. Focus may be on church attendance and groups, but lasting friendship won't be built in passing. Loneliness itself has been shown to have severe effects on physical and mental health, and I suspect spiritual health too. But it can be easy to be insular and to isolate yourself if you're told you're lacking something socially important, the relationship that society judges to be the most vital and desirable one. And the church shouldn't be adding to that. Church could be and should be a place where all are welcome and none are forgotten, where legal status doesn't put one person above another, but it will take effort and a desire to change. We need to think about how special days are marked. Our birthdays assumed to be something married people celebrate together with a hashtag date night or hashtag hot wife or some of the terrible things you might have seen on social media. Are weddings the biggest events or most regarded as achievements? Who actually makes up the fabric and community of the church? And who, are they, who is the teaching for? Who's actually speaking to them? As one interviewee for my book asked, who does what a mother, sister, or brother would do? 
Who is marking the significant occasions? Who is celebrating success, whatever success looks like for each person? And most importantly, how do people know that they are loved? It's been single people over the years, often single women, who have pioneered new ways of doing things, right back to the surplus women and way beyond. It's likely not much will change in the church's love affair with the nuclear family on its own. So take courage, look around, and see what you could do. The end. Yeah.